Do you guys know that feeling when you just feel like you need a closet revamp, a closet makeover? You feel like you have a bunch of clothes in your closet, but somehow always have nothing to wear? I felt the same way. I was looking at my clothes day in, day out, feeling like I just needed a reset. And luckily, I found Quince, and Quince has given my closet the upgrade that I desperately needed. I've built a capsule wardrobe with iconic and staple pieces that can be styled for any occasion. Quince creates timeless classics that will never go out of style. You'll have them in your closet forever, which makes putting together that outfit way easier. Quince has all the capsule wardrobe must-haves, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50, suede and leather jackets and silk blouses and dresses and here's the kicker all quince items are priced 50 to 80 percent less than similar brands by partnering directly with top factories quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us and to make it even better quince only works with factories that use safe ethical and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes which i love personally my favorite quince item is the cotton knit blazer i I have been wearing this constantly moving into the fall. It is such a staple for me, and I know that I will have it for years to come. The quality is insane, and I get tons of compliments on it. So take the drama out of planning an outfit and upgrade your closet with Quince today. Go to quince.com slash killer for free shipping on your order and 365-day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash killer and get free shipping and 365-day returns. Quince.com slash killer. Hello, you guys. What is up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I am your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every single Wednesday and you are not going to want to miss it. We also upload the video version onto YouTube every Wednesday as well. So make sure you are subscribed subscribed there. Now, as you guys can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are talking about a survival story. Sadly, being a true crime case, we very rarely cover survival stories. However, they are always so inspiring. Survival cases are some of the very few cases that we cover that have somewhat of a happy ending despite all of the physical trauma that has been endured. So as you can tell by the title, today we are talking about the survival story of Tanya Cash. Tanya's case is truly inspiring and it is truly a remarkable story. However, a lot of people have been contradicting on this case in terms of where they lie. A lot of people ridicule Tanya and they blame her for a lot of what happened during her captivity. So I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about it today. And with that being said, let's jump right on into it. Tanya Cash was born on October 14th, 19 81 to her parents, Jerry and Sherry. The two of them were high school sweethearts, and two years after getting married is when they had Tanya. Tanya grew up in a town called Monongahela, and that is about 25 miles outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and has a population of just under 10,000 people. For the first few years of her life, Tanya lived a very happy and normal childhood. Her dad worked as a union butcher and earned a good living while Sherry worked at McDonald's. Tanya loved her parents and loved having this image of the happy family. Her and her mom would go out shopping, they would do their hair and their makeup and all of the girly things together, and she also had her dad wrapped around her finger in those early years as well. The three of them went on many family vacations together, specifically to Florida, and they often went to Disney World. Tanya also 
also grew up being a Girl Scout and attended Bible school. So like I mentioned, for all things considered, Tanya's childhood seemed very idyllic up until around the age of seven years old. When Tanya turned seven, things in her home life began to unravel. Jerry got sick with pneumonia, which caused him to be out of work for quite some time, which caused a financial stress on the family. It was also around this time where Tanya witnessed her mom, Sherry, suffer from some pretty severe mental health struggles. Tanya recalls Sherry having erratic behavior. She would repeat words, burst into laughter for no reason, and be Become paranoid. Tanya even claims that one time Sherry set the coffee table in their home on fire. Tanya also witnessed as Sherry was having affairs with different men as well. Tanya claimed that her mom was having sex for money and one time Tanya remembers specifically picking up the phone while her mom was on the line with a man that she was having an affair with. Tanya jumped in on this call and told this other man to stop talking to her mom and that what they were doing was wrong. And as you can imagine, this made Sherry extremely angry, so angry that Tanya claims that she physically abused her that night. Jerry claimed that Sherry would often leave Tanya home alone for hours on end with no one to look after her, which also caused many arguments between Sherry and Jerry as well. There were multiple times where the police were called and one time when Jerry alleges that Sherry pulled a knife on her daughter. Around the time that Tanya was 11, Jerry finally made the decision to end the relationship with Sherry and even got the courts involved to have her removed from the home. Now, even though Jerry was doing this for Tanya's safety, it definitely affected her greatly and Tanya had a hard time grasping what was truly going on. These were a lot of changes that were happening in her life. Her mom was no longer living at home home and she couldn't really grasp why exactly all of this was happening. Again, Tanya yearned for this one big happy family image that she felt like she was seeing all of the other kids at school have, everyone else in the neighborhood all had their parents together and she had a hard time understanding why that couldn't be her case as well and it definitely drove her to a great sense of sadness. Now, shortly after Jerry and Sherry were officially divorced, which was around when Tanya was 13 years old, Jerry began dating a new woman, and this woman was named Joanne. Joanne and Jerry met through a dating ad in the paper, and Joanne at the time was living in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, which is about 30 minutes away from where Jerry and Tanya were living. Now, Jerry definitely saw this new relationship with Joanne as a completely fresh start for him and for Tanya. In about six months after after Jerry and Joanne began dating, Jerry moved himself and Tanya to McKeesport and they all moved in with Joanne. Now, Joanne also had a son who was seven years old at the time. So now Jerry, Joanne, Tanya, and Joanne's son were all living under one roof starting in August of 1995. Now, as you can imagine, Tanya was not thrilled by this move by any means. There were multiple reasons that she did not want to make this move. For starters, McKeesport, which is where Joanne was living, is a very, very unsafe area. It is actually known to be one of the most dangerous cities in all of the United States, and it's been ranked the number four most dangerous out of a list of 100 from the National Council for Home Safety and Security. Security. So Jerry and Tanya going from their comfortable little suburban lifestyle to now transferring into the number four most dangerous city in all of the United States was definitely a shock for Tanya. Along with that, Tanya just did not want to move to begin with. She liked her school. She liked her friends. She didn't like the idea of her dad dating this new woman, and it just wasn't the family image that Tanya had been wanting for her, her mom, and her dad. And when she moved in with Joanne, Tanya claims that she felt very isolated. She felt very excluded. She felt like Joanne was always inviting Jerry and her son to do different activities, and she felt excluded. She also felt that even when she expressed her feelings about feeling isolated, that her father gave her no comfort in those feelings. And it was a very difficult time for her. So along with all of the changes that were happening at home, Tanya also changed 
changed schools when she moved to McKeesport. She began attending Cornell Middle School, and again, this was a very rocky transition for Tanya. She was going to a school where she didn't know anyone, and the kids at Cornell were not very welcoming to Tanya, and she experienced a lot of bullying at the school. Shortly after she arrived, Tanya actually got into a fight, which led her to be suspended. And this is when the beginning of Tanya's rebellion really began. And this was when she was around 14 years old. She began drinking. She was smoking cigarettes, smoking weed, and she refused to talk to her dad about what was going on. And again, this was just a very isolating time for her. She felt like no one truly understood what she was going through. She felt like she had no one to talk to. So for Tanya, it was a mix of some pretty standard teenage rebellion along with struggles and hardships that she was dealing in her personal life and at home. So this is when Tanya began running away. She began running away from home whenever she would get into arguments with her dad or with Joanne. She wanted to get out of the house and not be there anymore. During the times that she would run away, she would run off to different areas of town. She would call her aunt. She would call her grandma. And just considering how unsafe McKeesport already was, this was a very dangerous thing for Tanya to be doing. Jerry would file multiple missing persons reports during the times that Tanya was running away, but each time she would run away, she would ultimately come back home. So every time that Jerry would file these missing persons reports, he would have to call the police and tell them, hey, she's back. We found her. She's back home. And over time, this unfortunately began to transpire a little bit as a boy who cried wolf scenario. By the second and third time that Jerry was calling police to report Tanya as missing, the police didn't take as much initiative to try and find Tanya because they were under the impression that she was a runaway teenager who always would run away and come back home. We've dealt with so many cases in the past where police are very dismissive when it comes to teenagers who go missing because they oftentimes think that they're runaways and the parents are very adamant on the fact that their children would never run away. They've never run away before, but this was very different. Tanya actually had run away in the past. And so again, that initiative from police was dwindling each time she would go and run away. Believe it or not, you guys, we are already getting into the holiday season and the holiday rush tends to mean more mailing and shipping for your business, but it does not have to mean more stress. Stamps.com has been helping businesses like yours save time and money for 25 years, and it can help you get ready for the holiday ramp up. All you need is Stamps.com's premium rates for all your postage needs. With Stamps.com, all you need is a computer and a printer. They even even send you a free scale so you'll have everything you need to get started. Now, taking care of orders on the go is even easier with Stamps.com's mobile app. And if you need a package pickup, you can easily schedule it through your Stamps.com dashboard. If you sell products online, Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Stamps.com truly is your own personal post office wherever you are. And for 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over 1 million businesses. You get access to USPS and UPS services that you need right from your computer anytime, day or night, with no lines, no traffic, and no waiting. Get business ready for the holiday rush. Get started with Stamps.com today. Sign up with promo code KILLER for a special offer that includes a four-week trial, plus free postage, and a free digital scale. No no long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code KILLER. Do you guys know that feeling when you just feel like you need a closet revamp, a closet makeover? You feel like you have a bunch of clothes in your closet, but somehow always have nothing to wear? I felt the same way. I was looking at my clothes day in, day out, feeling like I just needed a reset. And luckily, I found Quince, and Quince has given my closet the upgrade that I desperately needed. I've built a capsule wardrobe with iconic and staple pieces that can be styled for any occasion. Quince creates timeless classics that will never go out of style. You'll have them in your closet forever, which makes putting together that outfit way easier. Quince has all the capsule wardrobe must-haves, like 100% Mongolian cashmere sweaters from $50, suede and leather 
leather jackets and silk blouses and dresses. And here's the kicker. All Quince items are priced 50 to 80% less than similar brands. By partnering directly with top factories, Quince cuts out the cost of the middleman and passes the savings on to us. And to make it even better, Quince only works with factories that use safe, ethical, and responsible manufacturing practices and premium fabrics and finishes, which I love. Personally, my favorite Quince item is the cotton knit blazer. I have been wearing this constantly moving into the fall. It is such a staple for me, and I know that I will have it for years to come. The quality is insane, and I get tons of compliments on it. So take the drama out of planning an outfit and upgrade your closet with Quince today. Go to quince.com slash killer for free shipping on your order and 365 day returns. That's Q-U-I-N-C-E dot com slash killer and get free shipping and 365 day returns. Quince.com slash killer. So it wasn't the biggest surprise to Jerry or Joanne when they woke up on February 10th of 1996 and noticed that Tanya was gone. Jerry had discovered Tanya's pajamas left on the stairs of the basement of the home and a duffel bag missing from her room. Joanne immediately got in her car and started doing her normal routes, driving around town, trying to see if she could find Tanya. However, she was nowhere to be found. Now again, because of Tanya's history with running away, Jerry and Joanne figured that even though she was gone, she was ultimately going to come home. Tanya would typically always come home within a day or two of going missing. However, after four days had gone by and Tanya still did not return home, Jerry started to worry that something very bad had happened to his daughter and he called police to officially file a missing persons report on February 14th of 1996. So it's probably no surprise when I tell you that police were not super eager to jumpstart an investigation into Tanya's disappearance when they heard that she was missing. And so Jerry and Joanne were really on their own in the beginning. So several days after Tanya went missing, Tanya's grandmother actually gave Jerry a phone call and told him that she found something quite interesting. She claimed that the last time that Tanya was at her house, she had left behind a little piece of paper with a phone number on it. Once Tanya's grandma heard that she was missing, her grandma ended up calling the number that was on this piece of paper, and that is when a woman named Judy Sokol answered the phone. Jerry brought this information to police, and that is when police went down to Judy Sokol's home to have a conversation with her. When police got to Judy's house, she informed them that her home was pretty much a hub for runaway teenagers and kids who were having problems with their parents. She would always invite them in. She would give them clothing. She would feed them before they went on their way. Judy claimed that she last saw Tanya during December of 1995, during one of the times that Tanya had ran away. She went over to Judy's house and asked Judy for a jacket before heading on to her next stop. However, that is the last time that Judy claimed to have seen Tanya. And because of that, police went on their way. So now we're around the one week mark of Tanya being missing. And the next thing that Jerry and Joanne decided to do was go through Tanya's room to see if they could find any clue as to where Tanya could have gone or where she might be. That is when they discovered a note in her dresser. Now the note that was found in Tanya's dresser was written in a way that appeared to be a man's handwriting. And as far as the content of this note, in the note was basically a proposition to have Tanya perform sexual favors. Now, immediately, Jerry and Joanne knew who had written this note. Jerry and Joanne claimed that the man who wrote this note was named Kevin Churchfield. Kevin was an older man who was living down the street from where Tanya was living, so they were neighbors. Now, shortly before Tanya went missing, Tanya had told Joanne that her and Kevin had gone out to eat together. Now, this sparked Joanne's interest because she thought it was very strange that an older man who already has a son of his own would be trying to get Tanya, who was 14 years old at the time, to go out and eat with him. Joanne asked if they were with a group, if it was like a group gathering type of deal, but Tanya insisted that it was just the two of them and that Kevin was the one who initiated 
initiated this little date, for a lack of the better word, between the two of them. Joanne told Tanya that she needed to be careful around Kevin and that it was very strange that Kevin would want to go out to eat with Tanya to begin with, but Tanya brushed it off and said that it wasn't a big deal and that the meeting was basically to set up times for Tanya to babysit Kevin's child. And Tanya ultimately did end up babysitting for Kevin on several different occasions. So because of all of this, Jerry then brought the note and these new findings to police and told him about what he had discovered. And that is when the police told Jerry something shocking. Police told Jerry and Joanne that just several months prior to her disappearance, Tanya had filed a sexual assault report on Kevin Churchfield, which basically means that Tanya had to walk into the police department by herself, sit down with the officers and explain everything that had been transpiring during the time that she was babysitting Kevin's son. According to Tanya, she claimed that each time that she would go and babysit for Kevin, he would proposition her for sex and even force her to touch him inappropriately. Now, Jerry and Joanne were absolutely shocked to hear this because they had no idea that this was something that Tanya ever did. Now, things ended up getting more suspicious in this case because Kevin was arrested for this. However, the court hearing was set place during the time that Tanya was missing. So Tanya failed to appear in court. And because of that, all of the claims were dropped because Tanya actually had to physically be there in the court hearing in order for any of these charges to be set. So Tanya went missing right around the time that the court hearing was, and police had a hard time believing that that was just a coincidence, so they ended up bringing Kevin in for a polygraph test. Now, the first question that was on this polygraph test was, did you kill Tanya Cash? And that is when Kevin said no. However, the polygraph test showed that Kevin was being extremely deceptive. Now, in a state of panic, Kevin did admit that there was a sexual encounter between Tanya, which was something that he was adamantly denying before because because he didn't want to go to jail. However, even though he claimed that there was a sexual encounter, he adamantly denied ever killing Tanya. Now, police did end up getting a warrant and searched through Kevin's house. However, they ultimately found nothing. So there was no real evidence that Kevin ever abducted Tanya or ever murdered her. So they couldn't charge him for that. And they also couldn't charge him for the sex crimes until Tanya was able to stand in court. So because of that, they had to let him go. So at this point, weeks are turning into months of Tanya's disappearance and Joanne decides to go in to Tanya's room again and do another search, another deep dive to see if there's anything that she missed. And this time she did find something that she did not discover the first time. In between the mattress of Tanya's bed was a diary. Now the diary did have a lock and Joanne was able to pick the lock with a bobby pin. And when going through the diary, it definitely seemed very normal for a 14 year old's diary. She had little notes in there about her life and boys and her parents and everything of the sorts. However, there was something in particular that stood out to Joanne and that was the name Tom. The name Tom kept reappearing over and over in this diary, and Joanne and Jerry had no idea who this Tom character could have been. Now, something else that Joanne and Jerry picked up on while reading the diary was that it was very clear that whoever Tom was, Tom had a direct tie with Judy Sokol, the woman that police initially spoke to when Tanya went missing. There were several different entries in the diary that state instances with Judy and Tom being together with Tanya, without Tanya. So it was very clear that these two knew each other. And it started to make police wonder if Judy knew a little bit more about Tanya than she initially led on. So police decide to go back to Judy's house for a second time. Now, it was at this time that police had asked Judy about who Tom is. They had no clue who this Tom person could be, and that is when Judy told them that she had heard that Tanya had a crush on the security guard that worked at Cornell Middle School, where Tanya went. Now, the name of this security guard was Tom 
Hose. Tom Hose was 38 years old at the time and living with his parents while being the head of security at Cornell Middle School. He also had a son who lived in the house with him as well. Now, Judy also told police that at one point, Tanya did leave Tom a love note, but that's to the extent of her knowledge. Now, at this point, police decided to go directly to Tom's house where he was living with his parents. When they got there, they asked Tom if he knew where Tanya was, to which he adamantly denied. He actually told police that he was surprised that Tanya hadn't been found yet, and he gave police the note that Tanya had wrote him. He claimed that when Tanya gave him the note, the two of them were at school, and he immediately reported it to the school because he didn't want to get in trouble for anything, he didn't want it to appear like anything inappropriate was happening, and he brushed it off as an innocent little crush. Now, during this conversation between police and Tom, all of them were standing outside of Tom's home, and police had asked Tom towards the end of the conversation if they could come into the house and just check things out really quickly just to be able to check him off of the list, and that is when Tom denied police access to his home by claiming that his elderly parents were sleeping at the time, and he didn't want to disturb them. He didn't want them to see police and get all worried, so he told police that they needed to do it some other time. And so police left the house. Now, police were able to confirm with Cornell that Tom did report the note to the school administration. So because of that, police pretty much dismissed Tom as a potential person of interest, thinking that he was telling the truth, that he reported the note. And so they moved on from him. Now, this would actually not be the first time that police ever heard of Tom Hose. Now, this brings us back to Tanya's mom, Sherry. Now, Sherry was informed pretty immediately that Tanya was missing, and even though her parents were not together, Tanya still was able to visit her mom on occasion. And when Sherry heard that Tanya had gone missing, she decided to go through her phone bill. So she went through her phone bill and found an unknown number that Tanya had reached out to on the last day that Tanya was at Sherry's house. Sherry ended up calling the number, and that is when a man named Tom Hose picked up on the other line. Sherry asked Tom if he knew where Tanya was, to which he said he had no idea who Tanya was, where she was, knew nothing about her. However, Sherry still brought this information to the police and police pretty much dismissed it right away after they went and spoke to Tom and they insisted to Sherry that Tom had nothing to do with Tanya's disappearance. So now we're getting into years of Tanya being missing. Months have turned to years and it has been a brutal and agonizing couple years. Jerry had very little to no contact when it came to his daughter's case from police. He definitely felt like police were just dismissing the case and he was watching it turn cold right before his eyes. Now, this is where things start to shift a little bit. About two and a half years after Tanya went missing, in July of 1998, there was a body that was found in the McKeesport Cemetery. The body was of a teenage girl that looked to be around Tanya's age. She was the same height, same hair color, and the girl in the cemetery who people initially thought was Tanya, a lot of people were convinced that this was going to be Tanya. However, it was later found out and the body was later identified to be 14-year-old Kimberly Krim. Kimberly, like I said, was 14 years old and in the autopsy, it was found that she was sexually assaulted. Police began looking into Kimberly's death and that's when they found out that in 1995, so one year prior to Tanya going missing and about three years prior to Kimberly's body being discovered, there was another Another girl in McKeesport who turned up dead, and that was a girl named Anna Marie Callaghan. She was 16 years old, and her body was found in the McKeesport River. Her body was found with an extension cord around her neck and duct tape around her wrists. Now, police got DNA fingerprints from the duct tape and put it into the CODA system to try and see if it was a match. However, there was none. Now, at this point, police were really starting to see a pattern here. All three of these 
these girls, Kimberly, Tanya, and Anna Marie, were all teenagers around the same age who all went to Cornell Middle School. Now, this really led police to wonder if Tanya had already been murdered and just was never going to be found. And it also made them wonder if there was a serial killer on the loose. Now, the discovery of Kimberly was really the catalyst, as sadly as that is, that police needed in order to raise interest in Tanya's disappearance almost three years later. This is what really sparked their interest because now they were wondering again if there was a killer running amongst McKeesport and they wanted to get to the bottom of it. They ended up contacting the Center of Missing and Exploited children and this was the time period where the missing milk carton posters that were on milk cartons sold around the u.s was really popular some of you will probably remember getting the milk cartons and on the side of them they would have a missing persons poster on them and tanya's missing persons poster was actually put on over 400 million milk cartons all around the United States. However, sadly, as time passed, the case of all three of the girls went cold. So the case of Kimberly, Tanya, and Anna Marie, all three of them went cold, and this maintained for years. And I'm not just talking one year, two year, three years, something like that. I am talking 10 whole years. And then there was a break. On March 21st of 2006, police received a shocking phone call that changed everything. Police got a call from a man who told them that Tanya Cash was being held captive at the home of Tom Hose. Police were absolutely shocked when they got this phone call. They didn't know how much merit this phone call actually had because in their mind, they had already dismissed Tom Hose from being a potential person of interest or a potential suspect. But immediately when they got this phone call, they got into their cars and drove to Tom's house. When police knocked on the door, they could hear Tom from inside saying, oh shit, it's the police. At that point, police opened the door and when they did, they met face to face with Tanya Cash, the girl who had been missing for 10 years. The detective looked at her and asked if her name was Tanya, to which she replied with yes. Afterwards, Tanya looked over at Tom and said, it's over before she was immediately escorted out of the house by police and driven down to the police station. Tom was immediately arrested and Jerry, Tanya's father, was given a phone call to let him know that they had found his daughter alive. As you can imagine, the reunion between Jerry and Tanya is described as one of the most wild and craziest but most amazing moments of their lives because up until this point, even though Jerry was holding out hope, he truly thought that the odds of Tanya being found were slim to none. It had been 10 years, so he was absolutely in shock when he heard that she had been found. After being reunited at the police station, Jerry brought Tanya back back home for her first night back at her house that she had grown up in before her disappearance and the next day she returned back to the police station to tell police everything about her captivity. So here is what we know about Tanya's 10 years of being held hostage. So Tanya and Tom initially met when she went to Cornell Middle School. Tanya remembers Tom pointing her out one day in the hallways saying, you're new here. Tanya was already struggling to make friends at her school. Her life had just done a complete 180 moving and trying to just fit in. And she truly felt like Tom was someone who cared about her. He was funny, he made her laugh, he asked her questions. He was funny. He made her laugh and he was nice to her. Now, what we know looking back at this and seeing what transpired is that Tom Hose was grooming Tanya Cash. And over time, the niceness and the kindness began flirting. He would take Tanya out of class just to talk to her. There was one occasion where Tom caught Tanya skipping class. And when Tanya got all nervous that Tom was going to report her to the administration at the school, Tom told her that he was not going to report her. And that is the same time that he leaned in and kissed her for the first time in the school hallways. 
Over time, Tom and Tanya were spending more and more time together at school, having more and more conversation, and it was when Tom learned about Tanya's home life and how she expressed that she wasn't happy, she wasn't getting along with her dad, with her stepmom, Tom suggested that Tanya run away and live with him forever. Tom was telling Tanya things like the two of them could have an amazing life together and he could take way better care of Tanya that her parents ever could. And with Tanya being 14 and seeing this older guy who she had a crush on say all of the things that she was wanting to hear, she believed him. And so in January of 1996, Tom began to devise a plan for Tanya to leave her family. The plan was that Tanya was going to leave her house on the early morning hours of February 10th and go to Judy Sokol's home, where she would stay for about a month. During that month, Tom would meet Tanya at Judy's home. He would go back and forth between Judy's house and work because he wanted to see Tanya. Tom told Tanya that staying at Judy's house for some time was a good idea because he didn't feel like anyone would detect. Judy. Judy wouldn't be under anyone's radar when looking at people who could have possibly had something to do with Tanya being missing. When Tanya got to Judy's house, Judy told Tanya that they should change up her look a little bit. Now, of course, what Tanya didn't know is that the only reason for changing up her look was so that she would be unrecognizable to those around her, therefore prolonging her disappearance. So because of this, Judy cut Tanya's hair and dyed it. Now, again, and Tanya ended up staying at Judy's for approximately a month, and Tom would spend time from his house, work, and Judy's. And for that first month, Tanya really felt like things were going great. She felt like Tom was nice to her. Judy was nice to her. Throughout that first month, there was no sexual abuse, and Tanya didn't think that things were that horrible. However, again, she didn't fully understand what was happening. Now, after that first month, Judy told Tom that she wanted Tanya out of the house. She said it was time. Tanya needed to leave. And that is when Tom snuck Tanya into his home that he shared with his parents. He brought Tanya up to his bedroom, and that is where she stayed for years. In those first couple years, Tanya was not allowed outside of that bedroom at all all for any reason, even if that meant having to go to the bathroom. Tom actually put a bucket in his room where Tanya would use the restroom, and that same bucket is what she used to brush her teeth late at night and early in the morning. Now, after she had moved into Tom's house was when the sexual abuse began and Tom raped Tanya for the first time. And once the sexual abuse began, the threats from Tom also started. Tom would tell Tanya things like if she were to ever try and leave, he would kill her and her family. He also told Tanya that no one was looking for her, no one cared about her, and that she was better off just staying with him forever. Now, constantly being repeated these things over and over and over again, and Tanya only being 14 years old, it really got into her head psychologically, and she started to believe the things that Tom was telling her. Now, during the first few months of Tanya's disappearance, Jerry spent countless times driving around McKeesport trying to find Tanya, and he drove past Tom's house multiple times times, countless times even, because Tom and Jerry only lived about a mile and a half away from each other. It was really only approximately a 10 to 15 minute drive. And when Jerry didn't know where his daughter was for 10 years, the last thing he could have ever imagined was that she was 10 minutes down the road. Now, the first time that Tanya was ever let out of the bedroom was four years later in March of the year 2000. Tom had actually allowed Tanya Tanya out of the room and out of the house for the first time by herself. But of course, this did not come without its own limitations. When Tom let Tanya out of the house, he forced her to change her name. Tanya was no longer Tanya. However, instead, she was Nikki Diane Allen. The first time she was let out of the house was to go to a department store. Tom gave her $120 and a list of items that he needed her to pick up. 
Tanya admitted that she was terrified to go to this department store. She had been conditioned by Tom to go to the store and come back and look down and not talk to anyone. And when she got back, Tom was waiting for her. Now, over time, Tanya did gain Tom's trust. He allowed more and more freedoms as time went on. And what's wild is that Tanya was hanging out in the same town that she had lived in when she disappeared. However, because of her altered appearance, along with the fact that it had been so much time since she had initially gone missing, people weren't actively looking for her. They weren't looking at her and thinking of Tanya because so much time had past, as sad as that sounds. Now, Tanya became a regular at a deli that was down the street from Tom's house. This deli was called JJ's Deli Mart, and she would frequent there very often and became acquainted with the owner. The owner's name is Joe Sparico, and he owned it as well as his wife and his daughter. And Tanya really saw the Sparicos as the ideal image of what a perfect family looks like. It is that family that she had been yearning for for so long and she wanted to spend as much time with them as possible and ultimately Joe offered Tanya a job. However, again, he didn't know that she was Tanya because to him, he thought that she was Nikki Allen. Now, at the time that Tanya got the job at JJ's, she was approximately 23 years old and Tom was 45 years old. Now, when Tanya told Joe that she was dating a 45-year-old man, Joe made several comments to Tanya about how it was odd that someone her age was dating someone Tom's age. And Joe definitely tried to pry into the situation because he felt something was just off. However, time and time again, Tanya pushed his worries to the side, said that everything was normal, everything was fine. However, deep down, Joe knew that this situation was far from normal. However, back at Tom's house, Tom had introduced Tanya to his parents, claiming that she was his girlfriend. She was living with him. And it wasn't until Tanya began working at JJ's and saw what a normal family looked like that she began to be very introspective on her own situation and realized that what was happening with Tom was also not normal. And that is when on March 20th of 2006, Tanya finally decided to come clean with Joe about who she really was. March 20th, 2006 started out like any normal day for Tanya and Joe, who were the only two working at JJ's at the time. The two of them were working and having conversation when all of a sudden, Tanya broke down in tears. Now, Joe didn't know what was happening or what was wrong, and he asked Tanya what was making her so upset, and that is when Tanya looked at Joe and said, my name is not Nikki Allen, my name is Tanya Cash. She explained to Joe the entire situation of what had transpired over the past 10 years, how she had been kit- how she had been held hostage by Tom in his home, how she had been sexually abused for all of these years, and how she was being held captive at Tom's house. When Joe heard this, he told Tanya that he was going to take care of it and not to worry. He told Tanya that she needed to go home from work that day like everything was normal and not raise any alarm with Tom, which she agreed to do. And later that night, Joe was the one who called police and told them that Tanya Cash was being held at Tom Hose's house. Now, when police arrested Tom, the prosecution began building a case against him, and they got a warrant to search through the house. When they did, they found multiple calendar logs where Tom would actually mark down on the calendar the days and details of when he raped or sexually assaulted Tanya. He actually had the calendar color-coded for different sexual acts. Tom Hose was arrested and charged with three different counts of involuntary deviate sexual intercourse, as well as sexual assault, aggravated assault, interference with the custody of a child that is not a parent or guardian, endangering the welfare of children, corruption of minors, and indecent assault. However, the one thing that you might notice is that he was not charged with kidnapping. And that is because the argument was made that Tanya willingly 
went to Tom's house because she technically willingly moved from Judy's house to Tom's. However, she just did not know what was going to happen once she got to Tom's. And once she did get to Tom's, she was held hostage. However, again, she just didn't know that that was the case. Now, Judy Sokol was also arrested for her involvement as well, and we will get into that in a second. However, just so you know, she was also arrested. Now, let's circle back to the reconciliation between Tanya and Jerry and Joanne, and even though things were very good in the beginning of the reconciliation, sadly, things began to take a downward turn a few weeks after Tanya returned home. After some time of Tanya living with Jerry and Joanne, their viewpoint of Tanya's disappearance changed. Jerry believed that even though Tom did have some psychological hold on Tanya, he couldn't understand why she wouldn't just leave. He believes that Tanya had multiple, countless even, opportunities to tell someone what was happening, to get help, to try to escape, and he couldn't understand how she wouldn't just leave if she was that unhappy. Now, the fact was that Tanya ran away on her own in the beginning, and so that really didn't help this theory of theirs either. It honestly just strengthened it because Tanya did leave on her own accord. It wasn't like she was dragged out of her bedroom. It wasn't like she was held at gunpoint or knife point. She did leave on her own accord, and so because of this, Jerry and Joanne allegedly said things to Tanya such as, you chose to run away and they insinuated that she did this to herself. Now, Jerry said that he also wants to hear Tom Hose's side of the story because in his mind, he claims that there are three sides to every story, Tom's, Tanya's, and the truth. Um, regardless of all of that, Tanya was 14 years old when she ran away from home and it resulted in her being held hostage by her middle school security guard who was well into his adult years and she was held hostage for 10 years. Once she was set free, the sexual abuse that she endured followed her for the rest of her life. It caused her to have a hysterectomy. She had a colostomy bag for a year, and she also suffers from arthritis because she didn't grow and develop like she should have because she was kept trapped in a small room. Now, the police, on the other hand, believe that this is a textbook case of Stockholm Syndrome, which develops and relates to the bond between hostages and their captors, and hostages can believe that they need their captors and they're codependent on them. Tanya herself even said that she felt like Tom was a magnet to her, that she needed him. Every time she would drift away, she would feel the need to go back to him. So between the police and Tanya's parents, they have two very different ideas of what actually happened here. However, in 2007, Tom Hose pled guilty to statutory sexual assault, three counts of involuntary deviant sexual intercourse, and over a half a dozen other related charges, and was sentenced to 10 to 15 years in prison. Judy Sokol was also arrested and sentenced to 6 to 23 months. Now, I do want to take a moment right now and talk about Kimberly Krim and Anna Marie, because when Kimberly Krim's body was discovered, Tanya remembers that day very specifically. She remembers Tom coming into the bedroom saying that Kimberly Krim has been found dead. And Tanya was devastated because she knew Kimberly from school. Again, all three of these girls went to Cornell together. And according to Tanya, she said that Tom's reaction to this news was very cold and chilling. She claims that during the conversation, he crossed his arm arms and said something to the effect of, quote, well, you knew that was coming, end quote. Now, it should be made clear that Tom Hose was never charged or connected to Kimberly or Anna Marie's death. However, something very disturbing about the Kimberly Krim case in particular is the fact that where Kimberly's body was discovered in that cemetery, that area is directly visible from Tom's bedroom. The cemetery was across from where Tom's house was, and where his bedroom was, you could see the area of where Kimberly Krim's body was discovered. However, again, to this day, he has never been tied or connected officially to either of those deaths. However, it does seem a little suspicious. 
Now, when it comes to Tanya again, having to start over and rebuild a life after the trauma she endured was incredibly challenging, as you can imagine, or honestly, probably not as we can imagine, because I don't think any of us could ever fathom what that actually is like. Tanya even said that she had to figure out who the new Tanya was because the old Tanya had died. She had to rebuild her life, figure out who she was, and she actually ended up writing a book called Memoir of a Milk Carton Kid. Now, many people were not thrilled with Tanya for this book. In fact, a lot of people were very unhappy with her for it, and that included her dad, Jerry, and her stepmom, Joanne. Jerry actually even served her with papers to sue Tanya for defamation over what she wrote in the book. Tanya did have a section in the book where she said, quote, if my father would have paid attention and been a father to me, this never would have happened to me end quote. And Jerry was very upset by how he was portrayed in this book. And Joanne was as well. She explained that she had a terrible relationship with Joanne. She had a disconnected relationship from her father. She really didn't have the best relationship with her mother, Sherry, either at the time. And it really caused a lot of strain, which caused her to run away. Therefore, this is why that happened. However, in Tanya's world, that is truly how she feels about this entire tragedy that she had to endure. Now, Tanya's therapist also was someone who was not happy with this book because she also claimed defamation after Tanya wrote in the book about her. This therapist was someone who was working with Tanya after her captivity and after she was freed. And Tanya claimed in the book that this therapist eventually abandoned her and this therapist was not very happy with that either. So many people were not thrilled with the contents of the book, but it is out there. Now in February of 2022, so just a little over a year ago, Tom Hose was actually released from prison after serving 15 years and he moved back to the same house where he kept Tanya for those 10 years. He moved back to McKeesport in that same house that he lived in with his parents, which honestly is really disturbing and creepy and chilling and it just is unsettling all in all and Tanya is also living 15 minutes away from Tom Hose to this day and she's claims that she's still living in fear of the possibility of running into him one day which is just a wild thing to think about the fact that that would even be a possibility the fact that that's even plausible is crazy however that is the reality that she is living in however it should be noted now that Tanya is happily married she has two stepkids and is living the rest of her life to the best of her capability as a strong woman and that you guys is the case of tanya cash and i'm so interested to hear what you have to say about it obviously there's very conflicting opinions about this case and about tanya's captivity and everything that's involved in that so i'm very interested to hear what you have to say but with that being said you guys that is all for me today thank you so much for tuning in to another episode of killer instinct again if you're new here hi my name is savannah and i'm your host of killer instinct make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button that way you never miss an episode we post weekly on the podcast every wednesday and you're not going to want to miss it i'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys and until then stay safe bye guys